actually we have two consecutive talks of half an hour and um, as they're both on the same more or less topic we've decided to junk them one is right now that's thomas loninger from austria my home country and the next one is freddy kunstler from switzerland and they're both talking about the same problem you know the old churchill saying there's two things you don't want to know exactly that's how do they make sausages and how do they make laws <laughs> well actually you do want to know exactly how they make laws otherwise you find yourself with a law you don't want and a sausage I mean, you can avoid a banger but you can't avoid a law so thomas here is going to tell you about the fight for net neutrality in europe and uh, let's have a big hand for thomas loninger Hello and thank you everybody. Good. Um, so let's dive right in. Uh, we have a lot of ground to cover for the past three years which have to fit in the next 30 minutes. So I'm going to talk fast at the end so that we have a little bit more time for the outlook in the future. The subtitle of this talk is Alia Acta Est, so the dice have fallen, which in fact is not really true. We now have legislation in Europe for the first time, binding legislation for net neutrality in all 28 member states. And uh, this talk will be about the history of this legislation and how civil society played a huge role in this law. But still, the law that we have now is really ambiguous, so the fight is not over. There are next steps to come which will actually give it real meaning and influence what net neutrality will actually have in Europe. A little bit of introduction. So net neutrality, in principle, is the universality of the network. Um, as you see here, uh, we are all interconnected over the network. And um, the basic foundational principles that um, boil down in these days, in the age of deep packet inspection and discriminatory pricing, net neutrality boils down to discrimination protection. Um, and it's basically preventing ISPs to establish new discriminatory business models. And this was also the starting point for this European legislation called Telecom Single Market. It's a regulation that means it's directly applicable in all 28 member states. Not uh, like a directive, it doesn't have to be transposed to national legislation, it's already a law in all 28 countries. And the responsible commissioner um, back in September 2013 when it was introduced is this old lady, Neely Cruz. It is a fact that we are all connected and we want to be connected. So this package is essential for Europe's strategic interest, for Europe's economic progress, it is absolutely crucial for the telecom sector itself and, of course, for citizens who need full and fair access to telecom services such as Internet and such as mobile services. Such as Internet. Um, this is also the spirit of this whole law. You have Internet, which is kind of neutral, and then you have other stuff like specialized services, which you could basically translate in your head to net neutrality violation or paid fast lanes. And if you look at the original commission proposal, which they put in front of us, it had really weird language, like um, within the contract that you enter into with your ISP, you're not allowed to discriminate. But if the contract states that you have discriminatory pricing or different speeds for different types of applications, that would be legal under the original commission proposal. The commission had a threefold strategy. Um, it used the election to get um, the parliament to adopt this regulation really fast, um, to put it in a hurry, to rush this thing through before the elections in May 2014. It used a populist element, which was roaming. Um, if, you have any, uh, if you have heard any coverage about this legislation, it was probably about the roaming part, that um, Europe would abolish roaming charges, which is actually also kind of a fuzzy deal. Uh, you will still have roaming charges, but they will have different names and different forms. Um, but it was, that was something which made it essential for all MEPs, for all parliamentarians in the European Parliament to pass this legislation really fast. And they used bizarre and complex language, as you've just seen. Uh, the whole regulation was full of that. And the fourth point is that in their language, in the PR strategy, they were always claiming to support net neutrality. We see the same thing with Günther Ettinger now, the successor of Neely Cruz. He's also saying that he supports net neutrality, but in fact, he's doing the opposite. 
Um, so what have we done once this regulation was in front of us? Um, we started to write amendments in the wiki. Actually, it took us only a month to come up with the first improvements for this text. And I also said that I wanted to give some lessons learned. The first lesson to learn if you want to influence European policy is come early. The earlier you are on the table, the earlier you start talking with officials about a subject, the more influence you will have on the process. So if you want to influence legislation, don't look what is in the calendar next month, look what it's, uh, is in the calendar in three years. Then you have a good chance to really make a difference. And we had the Save the Internet campaign, which was actually launched here on that stage three years ago, um, and uh, the talk with Markus Beckedal at 30C33. And the website basically followed a simple idea. Translate attention into political force. Give people something to do. And provide actionable items. It's the second lesson that you can take away from that. You have to give something, people something to do. Otherwise, they will not care about the subject. Otherwise, they will not get really involved. They will not um, feel like they have a part in whatever political issue you want to raise and invest these, these actionable items, actually translate the attention and um, the will of the citizens into something that's in front of the officials, in front of the parliamentarians. In our case, calls, faxes, tweets, and emails. These were our actionable items. Um, and here I also want to thank uh, Michel Bauer, who was the core developer of all the contact your MEP tools of Save the Internet, besides the Pi phone from La Quadrature du Net who uh, sadly deceased uh, with a heart attack this year. And uh, <laughs> but without him, we never would have made it in, in such a good time. He developed the whole contact suite in like a week or so. He, is, he was a really brilliant person. So the fax thing was really cool. Um, we sent it around 40,000 faxes to the parliament, 20,000 of which were already also received by them. Uh, here again, I want to thank uh, the ISP Kappa, uh, who uh, sponsored us all those faxes for free. Uh, for the first round, we didn't have to pay for any of them. Um, so, third lesson is be creative. So, faxes were a novel thing. It wasn't done any time before. And uh, so they were really influential, because suddenly you would have a physical token of a citizen's will in the office of the parliamentarian. Um, but like every creative campaigning idea only works once or twice, now the parliament has switched to an electronic fax delivery. So this idea no longer works, at least not so efficiently. Um, so you have to adopt fast. The, this is the process in the European Parliament. Um, you have these several committees which all adopt their opinions on the legislation. And then the whole thing goes into the leading committee, the industry committee in this case, and then to plenary. Here I want to thank Petra Kammer, Eva, the German Social Democrat, who was like the only MEP that sticked with us from the beginning to the end. She was really fighting like hell, and uh, she was one of the good guys. One of the bad guys is Pilar del Castillo, the rapporteur down there in the ITRI committee. Uh, as a rapporteur, she has a lot of power over the process of this legislation in Europe, and she was really working against this wherever she could. Uh, and also working against the opinion of the European Parliament. So she was not really negotiating to get the good deal that the Parliament adopted in plenary in first reading. She was really working to get what um, the Telecos and Telefonica are wanting. And so in the plenary, we actually managed to get amendments through. Before that, it looked quite grim, but we had those uh, amendments which got a majority and which brought us the victory. And because this legislation is now passed and published in the journal, I'm now also at liberty to speak a little bit more about what is the background of it. And actually, um, as you have here in this, in this uh, email from a uh, UK Social Democrat, uh, the text came from civil society, which in fact is true. Um, when we drafted this text, um, there were like four things we had to, three things that we had to do. We had to fix all loopholes. We had to change as little as necessary. So only minor text changes. Every word is costly. And we couldn't use any politically loaded phrases. So we had to come up with totally new language, which would solve all problems, but still get a majority, which in fact we managed to achieve 
Um, there was also a bigger majority. Okay. So that's us celebrating after the victory. Um, and yeah, that, that was big fun. Um, so fourth lesson and, um, to take away is be clear about your demands with politicians. Uh, you will not succeed in uh, asking for stuff that you will not, that is impossible for the politician. You have to ask for something which is realistic. And in their eyes, getting a good text in first reading was realistic, but there were many formality arguments in second reading which uh, worked against us and at the end broke our necks. One was that the parliament is not really emancipated from the other institutions. Council has much more power, so the member states really can make demands and draw red lines that the parliament is not really willing to step over. And also second reading also means that you need an absolute majority for any amendment, not just a simple majority. So half of all MEPs and not just those who are present at the vote. Um, but it's not all just the first reading. Here you have basic idea of uh, how laws are adopted in the European Union with the Commission on top, the Parliament at the left, and the Member States and the Council on the right. And we had Save the Internet campaigns for all of those steps. And basically, when the Commission adopted their proposal, that was, of course, anti-net neutrality as its best. The Parliament fixed it. The Council reverted it and really came up with a text that was partly even worse than what the Commission originally wanted. And then, those three institutions sat together in the most, most intransparent way you could imagine and um, came together and made the new text. And the agreement here in Trialogue was actually reached at 2 a.m. with everybody is almost asleep, everybody like, okay, let's fix this, let's fix this. And the um, Liberals, the Greens, uh, the left, all of them were already out of the room. They were saying, okay, no deal. We'll continue after the summer break. Uh, let's just not continue any more discussion. And then the negotiator from the Social Democrats, Patricia Toya, she was already standing in the doorway with her handbag in her hand. And then she agreed to this proposal because the Conservatives gave her some concessions on roaming. Then she agreed to the shitty net neutrality. So that's actually what it boils down to at some stages. And it was Castillo who was driving this compromise. So we had a really bad text, which was on the table, and agreed between all three institutions, but then it would still need to go through Parliament. And we had to ask ourselves over the summer break, is this text worse than useless? Should we really fight for amendments, or should we fight for deletion? This was a huge argument within the Save the Internet coalition, and um, even I was sympathetic to both sides. But at the end, we thought this text is better than, for example, what the US had in their first net neutrality law. And therefore, it's worth fighting because maybe there are countries like Austria, like Germany, like the Netherlands that have or would adopt good legislation, but many other countries would not. And so, in the sense of European Union, we thought better have this compromise for all 28 instead of just a few good laws. And then something really magically happened because finally we got support from the US. Uh, we had Barbara von Scheding, the world's leading expert and scientist on net neutrality, uh, speaking out in support for us. So did Lawrence Lessig, so did Sir Tim Dermes Lee, and many other supporters. We also had companies getting involved, startups and big internet companies like WordPress, and we also had venture capitalists that urged the parliamentarians to really adopt these amendments, make this a clear legislation, because otherwise they would stop investing into European startups. Um, because I would not give money into a business model which might not work in a few months. And also in Germany, we had big support from the media authorities, the Landesmedienanstalten, and the Association of German Journalists, many others. But really, what we didn't do here, we didn't come early. It, this was all the last minute action. The real traction this whole thing gained one week before the final vote. And it was too late if we could have had this traction and this media coverage beforehand, then it might have turned out differently. But what you, what you can take away from that is that we have to broaden our movement, that we really have to go out of the net political nerd bubble. We have to reach other people. Digital rights issues are broad civil society issues, and we have to treat them as such. 
Go to the churches, go to the journalists, go to whomever is willing to listen and make your cause broaden the movement. And we had really creative actions, like here in Barcelona, uh, our member Xnet uh, had this nice projection on the uh, building on Telefonica. But at the end, it didn't work. We failed in second reading. And I have to speed up a little bit and explain you why this is not the end of net neutrality. Um, I know this was in the media uh, quite heavily, and if you look at it binarily, of course, this is a loss for us because we campaigned for amendments and we did not succeed. But still, the text that's now on the table, the biggest problem is that it's ambiguous, but it has some good parts in it. And one word of advice here, you have to keep in mind that the US also needed two approaches to get this right. The first net neutrality laws were even worse than what we have now. Um, there is clarity that this is now applicable not only to fixed line, but also to mobile internet. And at least we'll see no longer commercial blocking in Europe. You could still have state blocking, so like censorship lists from any public authority, but you could not, for example, block Skype if you uh, are a mobile operator and want people corner into using your own roaming. Um, there is intentional ambiguity in all the big questions about uh, net neutrality and paid fast lanes. And so the real decision is now left to the unelected regulators and to the unelected judges. Uh, we most certainly expect court cases in front of the European High Court. And this means huge legal uncertainty, uh, which is really bad, not only for citizens, but also for business. So there are four big, sub four big subjects we have to cover that are still in the debate now with the European regulator that's now tasked with giving this law actual meaning. Uh, specialized services, as I said, you could translate it in your head with um, paid fast lanes and not net neutrality, or with those services that really have nothing to do with the internet. That has to be our goal here. There are five safeguards in the regulation um, that we have to apply right, and then we can still achieve that goal. But um, the regulators, like these are the 28 organizations in, in Europe that are tasked with regulating the telecom markets. They are not doing anything else than reading laws and applying them on the market. And that's one of the questions they asked us in the hearing. Uh, so would it be okay to have internet services as specialized services? And you can see how really vague and ambiguous this law is, if this is the basic question that they are asking us. Um, similarly, with zero rating, the practice of commercial discrimination, if some data packages cost more than others. Again, we have some sort of safeguard here, um, but commercial practices is the corner word here, because zero rating is not mentioned in the whole legislation. Commercial practices, and that's the funny part, they are asking us, the regulator is asking civil society, what in our understanding commercial practices actually means. And from our perspective, there are two ways of seeing it. Either it means zero rating, in which case it has to be prohibited, or it means anything else, in which case, um, for example, it could mean interconnection that applies perfectly to the legislation. Um, but in that case, this uh, whole topic would be left for national legislation. So the Dutch net neutrality law could still outlaw zero rating, um, or Germany could adopt a new law which would prohibit that practice. A very important point, which was sadly not so much discussed, is traffic management. Um, there is a risk that ISPs could introduce a class-based SIF system to manage congestion, for example. And that would look like, okay, we have all video streaming applications in one class and we prioritize them. But we don't prioritize um, telephony applications because although they also are delay sensitive, um, they are um, against our own business models and therefore we are not prioritizing them. Uh, Class-based traffic management has another big problem and you can look at the UK where this is a common practice. Um, if you want to uh, throttle file sharing um, and you have some gaming applications that look similar than file sharing, you could end up with throttled file sh uh, gaming applications which uh, make the games unusable. And so in the UK, you have now standing committees between game developers and ISPs like Plusnet. And before they have a rollout of a new game, they have to sit down and agree on the technical characteristics so that the game actually works in the British internet. And this is the total opposite of innovation without permission. Um, and from our understanding, traffic management always has to be as application agnostic as possible. So, 
Only look at the header. Don't look in the, in the contents of the package. Don't look, uh, don't make any differentiation between applications or services. Um, and there's also a problem if you look at the content, if you want to treat encrypted traffic differently. There is a risk that all encrypted traffic could end up in this low lane. Um, so, in principle, this is what we want to achieve. Be as application agnostic as possible, and then only allow traffic management based on technical characteristics, where it is really necessary and proportionate. You cannot solve the problem in any other way. And then only if this is not sufficient, you could resort to a class-based system. Um, transparency, uh, we will see some big change here uh, when it comes to advertised and real speeds of internet. So if this regulation enters into force and if the transparency provisions are applied correctly, you will no longer have just up to a certain megabyte of internet. Instead, you will have a minimum, an average, and a maximum bandwidth, which has to be stated in a contract. So more accurate information for consumers. Now, um, this is the organization that is now tasked with making actual sense out of this legislation. So this is the umbrella of all 28 regulatory authorities in Europe, like Bundesnetzagentur in Germany or RTA in Austria. All those come together under the umbrella of Barrett, and they now have until the end of August, according to the regulation, to come up with actual guidelines that give this text real meaning. And if we look at the timeline, this is basically our work program, which we'll have to fill with life. Um, the parliament adopted the regulation in October, and it was published in the journal on 26th of November, which gives us the nine months of time we now have. And there was a stakeholder hearing um, from civil society. I could participate for ADRI. And uh, we basically sat down with the regulators and gave them our interpretation of the text. But so did also the content application providers, like um, the public broadcasters or internet companies, and so did the telecom industry. So now they have to strike a balance between those three stakeholder groups. Um, we are now at a point where the working groups are drafting the guidelines. Um, really weird fact, the whole regulation will enter into force at the end of April, although the guidelines are not applicable there. And nobody could answer the question what this actually means if there would be a case uh, in this period between April and August. So this working draft will then be voted in plenary at the end of June, and then we'll have 20 days of public consultation. You'll have 20 days to um, say what you think about the new net neutrality in Europe, which is ridiculous. And then they have roughly a little bit less than two months to analyze all this feedback and to redraft the guidelines. So the more feedback they receive, the fewer time they will have to actually redraft the whole thing before it's um, finally voted in an extraordinary plenary in pl uh, within Barrack so that it can be published. So let's focus on those 20 days. In the US, we had several months of consultation and 4 million comments. In India, it was 28 days, still 1 million comments. And they are continuing. They all have another consultation up and running right now. And now in Europe, we have 20 days. So this is the comparison that we face. And this also means for European civil society and all those people who care about the internet, this is the timeline and this is the opportunity that we have. And we can look at the US. Um, this is an analysis of the comments that were uh, given to the FCC when they first asked for opinions about net neutrality. And uh, there is now a huge uh, collection of scientific papers, visualizations, and everything about this huge record about the topic of net neutrality. So you can see that there are so many issues that um, also organically the people commented. You have very few templates in here. So uh, out of these four million comments, many of them are actually people sitting down, writing in their own words what they think about the subject, how it would influence their business, how it would influence their education how it would influence the network that they are running. And you have many interesting stuff like, you need net neutrality for the American dream. Um, and the idea behind that is also, and maybe we can take some advice from the US here for Europe, that America is America because you can connect to different opinions. At the core of net neutrality, you have the equality of the network. And 
This was preserved here with the new rules in the US, and we should really take advice on that. And that's also why we, as Save the Internet Coalition, will come up with a new version of the website uh, that will support the consultation and extend it, not just in the 20 days, but for a longer time period, so that more of you have the opportunity to have an actionable item, to do something for this legislation, and to really have your say. Um, in the remaining time, I would like to step a little bit out of Europe and follow the motto of this year's Congress and look a little bit at the global issue. You see now, there are many legislation now actually discussed or already in place. Uh, it varies greatly in the amount of safeguard that it provides for citizens. Um, and Thanks to Andre Meister from Netzpolitik.org, we have a little collection of all the billboards and advertisements in Latin America about zero rating. Uh, so let's have a look how this is seen in Peru and Chile and other countries. You have here uh, free social networking, which is huge advertisement bonus. And you have full internet with these 12 websites. Um, and uh, we're not speaking about nerdy stuff. This is like a selling proposition that you can have these services for free, therefore buy my SIM card, buy my internet. Um, and it goes on and on like that, but it gets really ugly if you look at what's happening in India right now. Um, Facebook has this program called internet.org, which is basically a gated community um, which gives poor people without any access to the internet just access to Facebook and, and a few other sites. Um, and Facebook is now on the offensive. They are asking citizens to lobby the regulator against net neutrality. Um, they are really challenged in that, and you could see that Facebook was fast responding because the public pressure in India amounted to, to uh, companies and telecom actors and also politicians publicly denouncing this program. Um, I can only quote uh, one of the founders of safetyinternet.en, uh, Nikhil Pava, uh, he said yesterday that the only question that he would ask Mark Zuckerberg, who is always the, the for, on the forefront to defend his program, why is he just giving these free basic services with just a few selected hundred sites instead of giving them the whole access to the internet? If you give the bandwidth that's reserved for these programs just freely to everybody so that they can use them in whatever way they want, you would achieve exactly the same commercial um, interest for the telecom providers, and there are similar programs from Mozilla uh, and also from other Indian ISPs that just give people, I don't know, three months of a few megabytes uh, to get them hooked on the internet. If this is just the idea to bridge the digital gap by getting people some sense of our internet, that could be easily done by that way. Um, so we have to look at the challenges for the global net neutrality movement. This issue uh, is, is far from just the Western debate right now. And uh, we always have been wondering in the digital rights movement how it would be if Google or Facebook would be on the other side of our debate, if they really would fight against us. We can look in the global south. It's first happening there. So that's the end of my talk and also my time. I want to thank you. Um, I want to urge you to keep fighting. Net neutrality is not lost in Europe. It's more like we now have a really ambiguous law. The responsibility lies now with the regulators. So we are, in a way, at the point where the US was in 2014. And now we have to do a similar mobilization. We have to do a similar form of argumentation to get it right. And um, Save the Internet is a coalition of 12 NGOs. Um, and we don't have... Uh, one fixed hub, but there is a lot of development going on in Austria, and we'll also have a workshop um, today at 6 p.m. at the Adria Assembly at Noisy Square. Um, if you want to get involved, if you have uh, a special interest in business or are an ISP, then please participate in uh, this workshop to get the new safety internet as best as we can. Thank you. Okay, we're going to do something unorthodox today. We're going to have the next talk right onto this one. 
please, we're on a flying change of people who want to come and leave, because the two talks are related. We'll have 10 minutes of question and answer after the naked talk. So here's, das ist jetzt eine Schweizer Angelegenheit. This is the gentleman from Switzerland, Freddy Künstler. He, he speaks Fribourg dialect. <laughs> huh? Can you believe that? Fribourg. And, um, yeah, and pretty good actually. We both agree that buffering sucks, so please let me have a hand for Freddy Künstler. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. My name is Freddy Künstler. Grüezi uh, miteinander. I was thinking uh, whether to have the talk in Swiss German or in English. Um, um, well, sorry, yeah, excuse me for never butting mind, in. Never mind. This is an author. When you leave, please leave in peace and quiet, okay? And give him a chance. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, Swiss German would be an option for me, uh, English, because German. Uh, as you know, the, the Swiss don't speak proper German. My, uh, my uh, six-year-old digital native uh, is telling people rather proud that his dad invented the fastest internet in Switzerland. It's called Fiber 7. I was... Um, thank you. <laughs> When we went to Greece uh, for vacation, I was in a, in a target conflict because I had to explain him why he couldn't watch YouTube. Um, I mean, Greece, you know, it's uh, maybe a bit difficult. But as a matter of fact, here in Hamburg, it's not any better. I'm uh, next door in the hotel uh, uh, intercity, and they offer free Wi-Fi with 256 kilobit. If you want 5 meg internet, you pay 8 euro extra per day. So this is where we are in 2015. A uh, few words about me. I married one son, as I said. Um, two, he, he was born 2009, and he was able to unlock the iPhone uh, with the age of 17 months. No one showed him how. <laughs> um, my early connection with digital techniques was about uh, 1978 when I was playing with these chips uh, 7400. Who knows them? Raise your hand. Few, thanks. Uh, later on I did an apprenticeship as a Fernmelde and Electronic Apparate Mondeur and uh, I started to uh, do IT business about 1991, and uh, 1996, almost 20 years ago, we started with Linux stuff. Uh, my first uh, Linux was SUSE 4.2. Two, in year 2000, we started with INIT 7, and uh, later on I became president of the Swiss 6 I Association. This is uh, uh, an as association which runs an uh, internet exchange I had also my time in the startup called Set2, um, did some network architecture, OTT, IP television. Um, and, uh, besides, I need a hobby, so I'm uh, uh, also a politician for the Social Democrats in my city parliament, already eight years. And uh, then I started with the other hobby, Fiber 7, as you know. Oh, besides, uh, I was also uh, working in the uh, internet expert group of the Social Democrats Switzerland, and uh, the internet um, paper was um, uh, uh, adopted uh, earlier this month by the uh, National um, Delegiertenversammlung. I don't know what this is in English. <coughs> so, buffering sucks. Ladies and gentlemen, this talk is not about Deutsche Telekom, it's not about peering, it's not about interconnection, it's about these thousands and millions of youngsters out there which want to watch YouTube in HD resolution without buffering. So let's, let's quickly look at the reason why YouTube and all the other video buffers. So it's usually, it's, it's lack of bandwidth. So you, if you have a two meg DSL or you have a, uh, intercity Wi-Fi, free Wi-Fi with 250 kilobits, um, so HD video is not possible. <clears throat> so in 
Sometimes uh, they have old P uh, P um, PCs, so CPU power is an issue these days, no longer relevant. Uh, Wi-Fi quality sucks. Sometimes this is rather an individual issue, and sometimes we have an oversubscription of the shared node, mainly in cable networks. Streaming source can be too far away. If you stream from the US, it uh, doesn't really go well. Um, that's why we have so many CDN content delivery network systems uh, uh, close to the end users. Then uh, adaptive streaming is, uh, it, it can be an, an advantage, but also disadvantage. You cannot turn it off uh, when you watch HD and uh, the connection sucks. You just cannot keep it on HD. It just uh, um, drops to SD or low resolution. It works, yes. Um, but um, uh, Claire Underwood in a low res is not so cool. Routing algorithm issues, sometimes it's a mismatch of client and server. If, you, if your client is uh, assigned to the wrong CDN server, then it's uh, also slow. Uh, any cost routing is a trick sometimes. And last but not least, and the most important thing, it's oversubscribed into connections. We go back quickly to the old days. The caller pays. When you call your mother-in-law and uh, you talk with her, well, she talks to you for 45 minutes and you say hello and goodbye, uh, you still pay the call. <laughs> so with YouTube, it's not any different. You click YouTube and then YouTube talks to you for hours, maybe, and then you say goodbye, basically. So is the broadband customer calling the YouTube server, or is it vice versa? Is the YouTube server calling the broadband customer? Probably the, it's, it's the broadband customer who calls. But still, the data is flowing from the server to the client. But the client is causing the traffic because he is requesting the traffic. And if we look at the structure of the internet, we have uh, basically the uh, Pro oh, oh, doesn't work here. Red button is dead. Never mind. Uh, the, we, have, we have the end user to the right. And, uh, we have his, the provider network. And the end user is only connected to the provider's network. On the left side, we have all the content in the internet. We have uh, the media and video and streaming and torrent and you name it. But there is always only one way going to the, uh, to the end user. It's the yellow marked interconnection points, and there is no way around them. And this basically means the provider can monopolize the end customer, at least as long as he's connected or subscribed. There is no alternative way. So this gives the provider a, 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 a position of power. On the other hand, these interconnection points used to be, uh, for a long period of time, uh, so-called zero settlement interconnections. And they are basically the foundation of the internet. Without zero settlement peering, without interconnection, the internet wouldn't exist as we know it. The broadband provider, uh, mainly the incumbent, the ex-monopolist or large cable operators, they tend to become more and more restrictive to provide sufficient interconnection capacity. Not upgrading interconnection to the requirements is uh, very common these days, and it's a passive, aggressive behavior. So the many, many uh, providers, um, to name a few, Deutsche Telekom, <coughs> um, they just do nothing. They just wait. And the end customer are suffering. Buffering is very common, especially during prime time. 
And uh, this is basically what the topic of uh, the main topic of this conference is. It's a gated community. The provider creates a gated community for his own end customers. So, as I said before, the data is flowing from the server, from the video server to the end customer. Uh, it's about 50 times more traffic flowing to the client. And uh, the, the usual traffic ratio we, we have uh, for broadband providers is 1 to 5 or 1 to 10. So they're pulling about 10 times more traffic towards the end customer. And uh, then we have this interconnection policy. So they, do, they don't do anything. Uh, as I said before, they uh, just oversubscribe the existing interconnection. And if you want to upgrade, you have to have a, a traffic ratio of about 1 to 1.5 to 1.3. But no video stream service can deliver traffic and also maintain the traffic ratio. No content provider can. So they, all they can do is they can pay money to get upgraded. And if they don't pay, data is stuck in, in congestion and the clients are suffering and see the, um, the, the buffering sign. Large broadband providers, such as the incumbents and ca uh, cable providers, they want to get paid twice. They, want, they are able to force the money due to the temporary monopoly, as I explained, and they can ask money from the end customer and on the other hand also from the content. This is called double-sided market. And if they don't pay, the content is not paying, this is what we see. And sometimes, as a side note, the end customer pays but still sees this. <clears throat> but IP, would, IP interconnection would be cheap. The business cost per broadband customer is just a few cents per month. And if the provider would invest this, people would be happy. And on top, content providers are easy to deal for peering or provide cash servers etc. So please talk to the com our community fellows of uh, Akamai, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Google, Limelight, Netflix. T is not telecom, it's Twitch, and so too, and a lot of others. So traffic congestion is costly. I uh, took a random Google search and uh, was looking for how much traffic is actually costing. And uh, Die Welt showed the result. Staus kosten in jedem Haushalt 509 Euro pro Jahr. So my assumption was, if traffic jam is costing money, then probably data traffic jam is also costing some money. But I figured that no one was really exploring that field yet. So I thought I'm going to do a, a, a little Milchbüchli Rechnung. <laughs> so, uh, when, when, when I was a child, the milkman came every, every morning and uh, we, we just put our order into the Milchbüchli and uh, he put the milk into the a uh, box outside of the house, and by the end of the month, uh, we went to the shop and paid our Milchbüchli hmm. uh, uh, so, so this is my quick calculation. Uh, we have about 30 million broadband connections in Germany. Uh, I assume that everybody's waiting for uh, one minute accumulated uh, to, while watching uh, Netflix, YouTube, whatever. Probably this is far too less. Who thinks one minute is fine, or who, think, who thinks one minute is not enough? Oh, okay, so let's, let's stick with one minute for the calculation. And uh, I also assume that uh, uh, five euro per hour waiting is, uh, is, is a good, good salary. So uh, if you think uh, five euro is not enough, um, so you can uh, adapt the calculation. This is called Reservationsloan. Uh, I have no clue what it means, but uh, this was on Wikipedia. 
for time when you take a job or refuse a job, how much would, uh, the, would, would the, be the value for the, for the spare time? So this is my calculation. If you wait one minute per day, this is six hours per year. If you, t uh, calc if you um, multiply this with the five euro, every broadband customer would be uh, with, uh, with 30, uh, we would pay 30 or loss, lose 30 euro per year. This uh, sums up with uh, uh, 30 million broadband subscribers to 900 million euro per year. This is the economic damage in Germany per year. And <laughs> as we can assume that a large part of the buffering is caused by the insufficient interconnection, especially during prime time when everybody wants to watch Netflix. Uh, this is also a result of the restrictive peering policy of the incumbent and large cable operators. Um, and the ability for them to force some extra money out of this uh, double-sided market power, as I explained, they probably would gain a few millions. I don't, I don't have exact figures, but I assume it's uh, probably some 10, 20, 30 millions per year they could, they could uh, uh, force uh, through this uh, market power. Uh, on the other hand, we have the damage of 900 million euro per year, and I mean, this is uh, like, uh, how do you say that? Uh, imbalance. So my conclusion, in democratic countries like Western Europe, the economic gain of a multi-billion company at the expense of the general public is commonly not tolerated. And the, then, then the next question is basically following my, uh, previ the previous talk of Thomas. When will the regulators wake up and force every market participant to, to cooperative peering and interconnection? Because the end user is suffering the public is suffering. Zero settlement peering, as I explained, is rather common. Of course, the, uh, um, the, the incumbent, the Deutsche Telekom lobbyists would tell otherwise, but uh, that's, this is clear. Uh, the unbalanced traffic should no longer be used to refuse peering. And uh, also disputes about interconnection should be resolved rather quick. Um, my case against Swisscom is taking our, uh, is taking years already, and still no end, uh, no light at the end of the tunnel. And then, last but not least, we should have uh, broadband providers be, must be committed to the interest uh, of their own end user customer uh, base. Uh, as I said, telecom managed to get paid twice this because of their market power and other telecoms, such as Telecom Hungaria or Swisscom, they use Deutsche Telekom and their market power as a leverage to, re to, to um, uh, force their also restrictive peering policy, and the regulators so far don't do much. I quote here Mark Furer, this is the chief of Comcom Switzerland, uh, nur ein fauler Regulator ist ein guter Regulator. <laughs> Thank you. Questions? <clears throat> Okay, thank you, Freddie, and let's have Thomas back up on stage, and we're going to take questions, please. Uh, there is, <clears throat> there's actually more than the mics I said before. There's two right up on the top, and there's three in each aisle. So if you please line up if you have any questions, ask, and please speak into the mic. We need your question on tape, and those who are leaving now, um, do it silently, please. Okay. First question. Wow. Yeah. Over there. I have no. a question for Thomas. Um, from your talk, it, it, it sounds like you did a lot of work. Can you tell us a little bit about the budgeting that goes into have a team like that? Yeah. Um, so, Save the Internet is a collision of 12 NGOs, um, which have all their independent budget. There is no um, fixed budget for the work that uh, we've been doing as a whole. Uh, 
all of them have transparency reports, um, so I cannot really speak for the budget of, of ADRI or Access. Uh, the organization where I'm based in Austria um, got a grant from the Media Democracy Foundation uh, from 10,000 euros and uh, money from Netflix, uh, 10,000 euro also. And we used both for development and paying for the faxes because in the second run of the fax tool, um, the provider that I was referring to was no longer paying. Um, otherwise, the funding in general about digital rights in Europe is awfully low. Um, so if you compare it to the US where you had double digit millions uh, going into the lobbying, it is ridiculous um, what, what resources we have here in Europe. Um, and we are thinking about making a donation tool for the new safety internet. But again, that's complicated um, because you have 12 NGOs with very different activity scales. Like some of them do a lot, others not so much. So how would you divide the money? These are unresolved questions that we're working on right now. If you want to support us with independent funding, then just donate to the individual organizations. Um, IDRI, Initiative for Netzfreiheit, um, are probably the ones I would mention most because they have done most of the work. Access now as well, but they generally have a lot of funding from the US, so I don't think they need it that much. So to summarize, I saw a picture of, of your team. I saw all the work you did. You did that for 20,000 euros? Uh, no, um, I never got a set. I, I, I was paid by Edry for four months when I was working in Brussels with them directly for the first reading, but otherwise this was mostly free time. I got my uh, expenses covered for travel, but other than that, I'm doing this in my spare time. And also now I'm employed. I work for a data protection NGO, so they are allowing me to do a lot of my stuff also for net neutrality, but yeah. We're all elephants, we do it for peanuts. Okay, yeah. number one, go ahead. Yeah, hello. Uh, hi, Thomas, thanks a lot for your work. Um, uh, gr uh, that's great. Um, I have a question about the involvement of the business, the angels and the companies. Uh, what is the reason, what do you think, why they came so late into this discussion in Germany and what probably can we do to change this in the future because I think that uh, uh, they are great allies in, in this fight. Yeah, that's, you're asking exactly the right question. Um, sadly, in Europe, you have no organized um, voice for startups or for SMEs when it comes to digital rights issues. Um, and you would have to work with them to get them involved in the debate. They were really late to the party and then again mostly activated through US networks. Um, so the connection between the civil rights scene here and the business scene, particularly the one which is organized in Brussels with European umbrellas, is very weak. Uh, so everything you can do there to strengthen this connection would be great. Um, but I don't have those business contacts. I, I got a few people involved in the first reading stuff, but we would definitely need more people that act as multipliers to get more companies involved. Particularly now, when we enter into a new phase with the Barrett guidelines, we no longer lead the loud arguments of, um, of, 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 of many people. We need more the, the arguments from the business side, from the universities, from those people who run networks, these arguments are better suited to make a difference with the regulators. Mm -hmm. because and, and, and to add, it, add uh, don't underestimate the influence of the lobbyists of the big names. I mean, the telecoms and the Liberty Globals, they have a lot of money. And they try to influence the politicians as good as they can. They, 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 don't, they do a good job from their perspective. You can be sure that uh, the telecoms will have people for all 28 regulators now continuously lobbying for an upcoming nine months. Indeed. The question is who is in our team? Mm -hmm. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Is there a question from the internet yes. while we're at it? Yes, there is a question. It is um, whether peering providers should differentiate between virtual private network traffic and public traffic. And is the, uh, where is the line between internal, internal network and the public internet? What should I say? This is a difficult question. I mean, basically, 
uh, if you overcommit your backbone, then there is always plenty of, of traffic or plenty of capacity. So there, is, there shouldn't be any differentiation. It's just networks should provide enough capacity and then we're good. A common, a common, uh, uh, a common argument from the big names. Oh, we are investing millions and millions and millions in uh, broadband expansion. But unfortunately, they stop investing right at the end of their own backbone. So they don't invest any money. And that would be only a little percentage of the, whole, of the total investment for the interconnections. OK. <clears throat> there is another question at number one. Uh, I have a question about buffering. <laughs> so the most of the content in the web is delivered over TCP IP. And uh, will changing the media to something like UDP, which has lower overhead over TCP IP, will that change the situation? Uh, not really. No. Not really? No. It won't help. I mean, uh, packet loss is packet loss, regardless whether it's TCP or it's uh, UDP. Answered my question then. Okay, well, that was a short answer. Uh, <laughs> next question, please. Please talk into the mic. So, when I came here this year, I had the impression that at Digital Subscriber Line connections, uh, not only the bandwidth is bad, but also the um, ping gets up way high. Mm -hmm. Of course, I mean, at home, I have Fiber 7 nowadays, so I just thought I got spoiled by fiber connections, but uh, I noticed that ping times went up from, well, from a couple of years ago, 60 to 80 milliseconds from uh, sites in your neighborhood, more or less, um, to nowadays 80 to 160 milliseconds. So where's the problem there? Well, the latency is directly related. Uh, if the provider is not delivering enough bandwidth, then ping, ping goes up. That's, that's a normal behavior of, of, um, of TCP. So the problem is also uh, at the interconnection sites? Probably, yeah. Thank Most you. likely. You can find out if you, if you do trace route. Um, then you see where, well, there, there is a, a, long, a long presentation how to interpret trace route properly. Uh, uh, if, you, if you look for a NANOC trace route, you should find this lecture. Uh, uh, but that would probably give some indication. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, next question from the internet, just in between, and then we'll go back. Go ahead. Is Netflix a gated community by itself? And are you sure that their interests will align with the movement of net neutrality in the long run? Um, we should differentiate between Netflix content and Netflix interconnections. Mm -hmm. So for the content, I probably would say yes, but I'm not, I'm not the expert. This would be then layer seven in the OSI model. I'm talking here on layer three. This is content agnostic. Um, Netflix, is, they are one of the good guys because they really help to deliver the packets. And uh, I know them personally, a few, a few uh, uh, fellows from the, from the peering community. Uh, they are the good guys, definitely. Um, just also to ask the, this question for the European debate. Um, Netflix was one of the good guys in the US, and they also supported, of course, the, the European movement. But again, they are so big that I wouldn't really trust them as an ally, um, because they could also pay. They could also survive in a double-sided market. And, um, for them in the growing emerging markets like Europe, where they just have started, it's probably risky to allow for this new type of anti-net neutrality business models. Um, but um, in the consumer side, when net neutrality is seen as an end user issue, I think so far the, the interests mostly align on, on interconnection. They have their own interests, of course. Yeah. So I can say Netflix is definitely paying Deutsche Telekom. Otherwise, no single Deutsche Telekom user would be able to watch any movie on Netflix. So, okay, for sure. We're short for time, so please, last two questions, one, number two first. Keep it short, please. Talk into the mic. Uh, regarding your first talk, uh, what is the 
do you have an explanation for the behavior of the European Commission in behavior of the uh, net neutrality debate? I th especially think of the behavior of Günther Oettinger, who uh, we repeatedly said his ridiculously, ridiculously, ridiculously lie of uh, net neutrality kills, and he repeated it again and again, even if it was, uh, even if there was no reason behind it. And do you have an explanation for this behavior of the Commission mm -hmm. and Juncker and this? Um, for that argument, we had this great YouTube video, Net Neutrality Kills, if you search it, you'll find it, or Net Neutrality Tötet in German, um, that de deconstructs this argument of Oettinger. But in general, and you can go back to the previous Commissioner, Nili Cruz, that I showed, um, our strong suspicion is that the deal was that uh, the telecom industry has to give up a little bit of their profits when it comes to roaming, but on the other side, they gain a lot of future profits on the abolishment of net neutrality. And so it was like, okay, we need a populist argument. Neely Cruz also needs a quick win at the end of her career. Um, and this was again like, you take a little bit there and put it there for the telecoms industry. And Oettinger is a big industrial favor guy. He is always for big business. Okay, short for time. Last question, number one. Okay. Hi. Um, so, what strategy should an ISP use when their capacity on their backbone is fully loaded? Like first in, first out, or what is your idea about that? <laughs> because the capacity is limited. So, when there's so much traffic that everything is stuck. Upgrade. Well, yeah, <laughs> invest in the network. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, sorry, a, a 10 gig port is now some 3,000 euro, including optic and cross connect. Okay. It's, it's, <laughs> it's not that, that much. Upgrade. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Let's have a hand. Brady Künstler, Thomas Lohninger, thank you very much and goodbye. <laughs>